So one of the things I'm going to do, ordinarily my uh, the program that I run with that you all might be familiar with is, you know, I'll do the what's new and then we'll bring in our speaker. But there was such a phenomenal amount of updates and with Ignite and some of the things that are coming, just just huge. Um, I was working from 6 a.m. through to 11 o'clock last night and then again all morning putting together the deck for you today um, and the insane amount of content that's in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little bit about some of the new things that have come in from the adoption side, of a couple of adoption side things. Then I'm going to bring Megan in to do her, you know, speaker piece. And then after that, I'm actually going to do the what's new. And I am going to be flowing over. Please feel free to stay or not. As you know, you know, it's up to you. You can go back and watch the recording if you like. Um, every every month when I pull together the what's new for you, it usually is at least sort of eight, nine hours minimum of content to pull together for you. Um, so, you know, it takes a fair bit of work to get us ready, let alone speakers and things like that. But this time round, I, even then I stopped. I actually had to stop. It was like quarter past 11 and I just went, I can't put any more in and a lot of it is just links and go and have a look yourself but what I might do is next month we might come back around to some of the things that I think that you know maybe we I didn't present that are really quite core cool to be able to help and support you in terms of the learning and journey and what's actually going so as part of doing your um, uh, live presentation here you can click through the pages you know should you wish to if you've got a run you can have a bit of a quick click through I wanted to try and do that for you this time around considering um, but um, let's let's see how we go. Um, and if any point you want to ask a question or you want to interact, please you know throw up the hand up the top there. You got all your little emoticons along the way. Okay, let's kick off. So the recording link will actually be in here after the session. I always put this link for you inside Meetup as well as um, I put it out on Twitter. I put it out on LinkedIn and I'll also drop it into our chat in here. So you should have history of the chat to be able to come back to at any point. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians in the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples here today. I always get tongue twisted at the end. I don't know if you've noticed. <laughs> it's a going, going thing. We do have a code of conduct in terms of being welcoming, open. You're used to me sort of going through this. Be friendly, patient, use the right kind of gifts and, you know, respectful of all those that we've got in terms of diversity and inclusion. No, the recording is not actually um, deleted after 30 days, Victoria. I always pull it down, I load it up into my SharePoint and I share the link back out so that you've actually got the, uh, you know, a good full link which won't cause any particular issues for you. It's why it takes me just a little bit longer to provide it for you because I try and make sure it's as stable. I'm looking at trying to bring them over onto YouTube, but YouTube kind of wants you to get to be a trusted person by putting a ton of like 10 minute videos up first before it'll allow you to load hours of content. So that's one of the, what do I put up that are 10 minute content? My name is Kirsty McGrath. I am an adoption consultant on Point Solutions, running those user groups. So this is what I've done in the last month. I know I tend to give you a bit of a, what have I been up to? I do jigsaw puzzles and things to shut my head down from all that tech. Um, I, you know, this week has of course been an insane week with um, Microsoft and um, Ignite being on. It was from 2 a.m. till 10 a.m. each day that I was on with the conference. Um, and I'm always reading what's new, so I need something to shut it down. The middle one there, the middle cake, my sister-in-law made me a really beautiful patchwork quilt and I replicated for her birthday the cake back to her as a patchwork. So I had a lot of fun doing it. It was a lot of work. Um, but we had some fun. And my um, nephew loves Minecraft and he won a Pavlova Minecraft. I went, <laughs> give me a challenge, why don't you? So I went for a Pavlova Minecraft. All right. I know, chocolate, I know you see all that. Actually, a lot of them were uh, caramel mud cake as well. So, you know, if you like a bit of caramel with Biscoff, if you like Biscoff. If I never had Biscoff, don't have it. You'll get addicted. <laughs> okay, so what's new to adoption? Um, Caruana has actually put out now an adoption newsletter. So what you can do is subscribe to it. It's actually on LinkedIn. Now, because this is a live presentation, these are all active links. So if you want, you can click on anything inside the presentation and you'll go to it. 
Um, go subscribe because what she's doing is then launching, you know, all the things around adoption to be able to help and support you. Um, there's also now on Twitter, they've actually, and it's wonderful to see that they're focused on adoption and you can tag the at Microsoft adoption and they'll be pushing out all things new and what's going on in the adoption space through Twitter. So loving that one for us as a community um, and Microsoft taking adoption very seriously, quite different than when I first started in this space a long time ago. Um, uh, so, you know, good to see. Um, there is some new learning content that's actually gone up into learning pathways. If you're, you know, putting learning pathways into your Microsoft Teams or your tenant, you know, got it in your tenant through SharePoint. Um, so now there's more content around edge shifts, bookings, and lots of core content around Teams, Outlook, and Word. So there's um, new features. There's a whole very long list if you click on the link to go to. There is now Power Platform has gone through into the Microsoft Adoption website. So if you're rolling out Power Platform or you're trying to deal with it in terms of some of the best practice, it's now live on the Adoption website. The Microsoft Ignite Book of News. This is where you're going to go for all things new. I'm going to go through some of it, but certainly not all of it. Main focus, of course, for me and what I'm working on through here is the Microsoft 365 and Windows kind of content. So um, that's where I'm going to be spending space. I haven't really bought in the Windows 11 sort of 365 content. Um, it's really focused more on the 365, you know, side of Microsoft 365 time of things. Um, um, and Victoria is asking if anyone's using the learning pathways. They're looking for some case studies. So, um, you know, if there's anyone out there would like to connect with Victoria, then uh, please feel free. Uh, go and have a look. And I put here the link in this page to the Ignite guide to what's sort of happening around SharePoint, OneDrive, VBus, lists, syntax, the whole lot. It's all there. Um, be able to support you. Here is a screenshot. It was a high-level screenshot that came out from Mark Cashman around some of the sort of the high-level updates of which we're going to go through of what's going to be coming over the you know coming year or so. There are a few there that I do particularly love, um, and you know I'll, I'll touch on those ones as we go. I'm not going to be going through, of course, things like the admin migration, security graph kind of space because I'm focused a bit more on the end user. Okay. So the product news blogs from Ignite, these are all the different links to be able to help and support you. Mark Cashman had kind of put it out and it was on his page. I've brought them in for you. The top three are ones that I would highly recommend from Ignite that you might want to go and actually have a look. They're very high level kind of overview of of uh, what they're sort of thinking and looking and sort of the strategy side of where they're going. So there are two pages there of all the blog news. It's all collated into one area for you. Now, the one thing I thought about was, <clears throat> you know, one of the things that we haven't kind of bought in for a while or thought about, and it came up in one of the conversations we we're having. So Graham Walsh is an MVP. And as part of Unified Communications, he's got a swag store that he's actually pulled out. And you can you can actually order from Australia. And it's very much about uh, Microsoft Teams rooms and Microsoft Teams in terms of communication. And it's got their, you know, um, don't let friends use non non um, certified devices like, you know, because that whole using our iPhones, uh, you know, headsets and things like that are not good for these types of environments in Teams. So he's got some really cool swag there around Teams. And if you're thinking about champs or you're trying to roll out, they have put in here a couple of other swag sites. So Microsoft had two swag sites. The DKM Blue is actually a swag site that I've used for a really long time since I was at Microsoft when we used to actually purchase um, a different swag and I'll lose, use it for my clients around chain champs. And in there are... Um, mainly focused on sort of office and uh, teams it's sort of what they what's in there um, the swag site the my bright site is a lot more focused on um, teams there is over on the far left hand this is a you know a private another sort of MVP Yammer swag so if you're looking at trying to reorder some swag around Yammer or something like that so there's four different links there for you if you're trying to support your organization and um, the pack that I've put there the eco bundle is something you might consider for maybe you change champions because you get sort of 28 um, computer backpacks and you get pens and you get a power bank um, and you also get a, um, a t-shirt for your for your maybe champs if you're rolling out a particular program and for three thousand dollars it's actually a really good and worthy investment um, and considering you get so many pens you get something like 400 pens with it you could use that then for the rest of the business 
a bit of a touch back a week and find things. Um, the change champion calls, if you haven't actually signed on in terms of the change champ calls, they run every month and there's lots of content in there. It's all through the adoption website. If you've not actually gone and had a look, I'd highly recommend go back and watch the recordings because, you know, a lot of times and they do run two sessions, an AM and a PM session in terms of US time. So you could watch our you know, our time zone effectively. It's usually sort of early in the morning. If not, you can always go back and watch the recording and get presentations. There's lots of really cool things. The next presentation is on November 23rd. So these are a little bit of a reminder. Often I've got them in a link at the very end, but maybe you might not look at it or, so I'm just bringing it back to focus. Microsoft have pulled together a rather cool sort of collections, a learning collections, where they've got resources that have been pulled together, things like community blogs and learning pages and other digital events that are going on. I um, highly recommend it sort of they're bringing a lot of content together into one space and they're doing it more and more, which is really great to see. So did you lose the presentation? I'm seeing it uh, on my phone screen. Anyone else have lost it? It's okay here for me. You might just need to potentially um, drop out and come back in. So, Lena, all good. Radio. Um, virtual training days. I've actually signed up for this one. Um, next week, it's running for two half days, and it's this particular one was around enabling remote work with Microsoft Teams. So, if you want to do that, you can actually join in. It's remote learning for two half days next week. So, it depends whether you've got Tuesday, Wednesday free in the morning, but they do run these fairly regularly. There are other ones. I've put it in the local time zone, but you can see that there are other. You could do all sorts of time zones if you wanted to do an early morning or potentially, you know, late evening. They have them in different languages as well. And um, also good for your team if you kind of go, it's a really good idea. There's a lot of Azure stuff there. If you've got internal tech guys, for example, um, there's lots of other content in there for you. I've put in here, there's, you know, one or two little videos that have come out off the back of Ignite. They've all just gone live. I'm not sure if, uh, and I know some of you here were on the video call uh, that we did that on, our, on the user group with the Modern Comments team. And we had a bit of a, you know, get together the Modern Commenting team. It's there. They've got the presentation down the bottom there in terms of us providing feedback and ideas around what it looked like. So Theo has actually put out with his team a little bit of a video around asynchronous collaboration where we're looking at you know we used to do that kind of networking with disparate groups but now we're all kind of a little bit more disparate so it's like well what does it look like around asynchronous collaboration now and it's about using some of the features inside 365 around sharing and comments and version history and if you're it's a good little video it own it goes for about 16 minutes um, one to have a look at it can even be one that you might actually share around internally inside your organization to help people do some learning in a newsletter, for example. I think it's a rather good one. So I'm going to stop there because I'm conscious I've ever, even on that, just gone past my 15 minute intro, although we did start sort of four minutes late. Um, so I shaved back an hour. And as I said, the content that you've got coming, you might see that there's sort of 77 pages in here. So um, a lot of that sort of intro and a little bit of the outro kind of thing. Um, so I'm going to hand over into now, of course, our very illustrious speaker. Um, what I want to do is let, I'll let her kind of introduce herself a little bit. But Megan and I were having a conversation around, you know, that human side of 365. There's so much content coming out. What does it look like? How do we how do we help people um, along on the journey? And if you've got any questions along the way, please feel free to type them in chat and I can always ask Megan or throw your hand up and go, I'd like to dive into that and we'll have some Q&A time at the end as well. So I am going, do you have anything that you need to present? Um, me, uh, me, do you want me to hand over control for you? I do, I'm gonna kick you off. Excellent, go for it. I should probably I'm always, I'm always before happy before. to be kicked off. <laughs> Hang on a sec. All right. Now, I have a really bad habit of not seeing chat. So, yes, definitely, Kirsty, if you could um, interrupt me if people want to ask questions and things. Yes, absolutely. I'll, I'll yell them out along the way. I'll try not to. It should be pretty quiet here, but I'll go on mute anyway. Sure. Um, so hi, everybody. There's a few familiar faces, some old Booper and some new Booper that I've just discovered, Jacob. Um, uh, definitely a few 
people um, that I've come across before and some new faces. And we've even got regional Victoria here, which is very exciting. I was there at 6 a.m. I just came back to Melbourne today. Um, so welcome. Um, my name's Megan. And um, as Kirsty mentioned, we were chatting recently um, and yeah, we, we she asked me if I could come and do a session. And we ended up just inadvertently having a big discussion about learning and some things. So I went, you know what, well, I'll just talk about that. Um, so I'm going to run through just Maybe some Maybe explain kind of a little bit about who you are and what you do. Yeah, yeah. I put in the intro for you because I couldn't find all my blurb and I just went, ah, you can do it. <laughs> um, so my name's Megan. Um, I'm a Microsoft 365 consultant um, and I'm currently an independent consultant. Um, so I've worked with partners for about 10 years, um, a couple of different partners. Um, and probably as a result of the pandemic at the start of the year, I just decided to go back to doing independent work. Um, and so I fluctuate full time, part time, depending on projects. Um, so a majority of my work in the last 10 years has been Microsoft 365. Um, my background is psychology, organisational change, um, and somewhere in there I was a technical project manager as well. Um, so I have a very um, organisational change background and very people focused. Um, I've always been focused for a long time on the impact of people and I've seen a couple of titles in here. I know there's a lot of, you know, uh, digital adoption people and a variety of roles. Um, so we come from, I think, a lot of us the same space. Um, and currently I'm studying a Master's of Education. So that's also another reason for my job change earlier in the year is to be able to shift my focus a little. And as a person, um, I'm curious. I'm very passionate about human behaviour. Um, I have a big passion in diversity and inclusion and accessibility. I myself have a hidden disability. There's another session on that next week somewhere else. Um, but I'm just really passionate about the experience of people, basically, um, whether that be neurodiversity or just workplace behaviour. So it's a big, big focus on everything I do. So today's session, um, what I thought we'd talk about here, and I'm sure you've seen the blurb, but essentially I wanted to separate the discussion or the presentation into some of the stuff we're seeing in clients and whether you're on this call because you are in internal role and it's your organisation you're interested in or whether you're a consultant and you work with other organisations, I'm sure some things will resonate as far as what you're seeing in your organisation and the experience you've had in the last 12 months. So we just wanted to, I want to talk a bit about experiences from engaging with a number of organisations, um, some of the common themes. Um, now, I actually did a count recently for a blog and realised that it was really rough that I've engaged with about 80 clients in the last 10 years through different partners and work that I do. So there's a lot of experience there in seeing the technology change, um, how projects have changed. You know, every time we do a new project, the tech has changed a lot. So, it's, you know, what we're delivering, but also then what is happening on the client side. Um, so what we're seeing, and then I want to talk a bit about the results very briefly about that. So some of the observations on outcomes from the patterns we're seeing in adoption programs and project delivery. And then also a bit of a discussion about the path forward. I'm going to talk about some things to consider in moving forward with regards to change management, learning, and just people within your organisation. So firstly, let's dive straight in. And firstly, I want to talk about what we're seeing. So these things are not going to be a surprise because the first major thing that we've been seeing in the last particularly 12 months or few years is rapid change. A lot of us have been getting by and it's not slowing down. There's more and more ongoing change. There's so many features that are coming out all the time. And it's funny going on the back of everything Kirsty just talked about with Ignite this week. You know, even just this week, there's that kind of exhaustion and fatigue and onslaught of new things coming. So there's more and more ongoing change. There's more features all the time each month. And this is not necessarily negative. I mean, it's exciting. There's a lot of innovation, but it does also come with exhaustion to an, to an extent as well. A lot of people talk about change fatigue. It's a very common term you've probably many of you heard of. Um, but also I like to think about communication fatigue. I think there are a lot of people, you know, it's been a tough 12 months or almost two years. We just want to get our job done. So it's been hard enough in some ways getting your job done and getting through life. Um, and then with that, all the constant communication around things we need to know, things we need to learn and get across. A term I came across a few years ago with that is change whiplash. Now, I love this term because I think we can all remember back to maybe April to July last year when we all had to rapidly work from home probably a bit of a feeling of change whiplash in that phase. You know, 
when Microsoft pushed out so many rapid features to help enable better working from home, but there was a lot for us to pick up and work with. So have a think about things like, you know, how many teams are you in, in Microsoft Teams? Or what I like to also think about is how many different ways of working you have to do and get across yourself. For example, sometimes with, depending on the department that you're communicating with or engaging with, depending on the organisation, sometimes literally with one department, you know, it's email. They want to do everything in email, keep a record and communicate there. And then you go and shift and work with a different department and suddenly it's all about Teams chat and online documents. So we can find that we're not only busy and involved in a lot of work in different spaces, but that can also be inconsistent. Have a think about the meetings features launched over the last 12 months. Now there's been new features recently, but think about last year. I think I would say um, background, effects, background effects was one of the most rapidly adopted features I've ever seen in the last decade in Microsoft 365. And now that was obviously we can acknowledge why, you know, we wanted our privacy at home. It was fun and exciting and it was required, but it was amazing. I remember thinking we're going to have to train an organization on it, logging onto a session and finding they all already had background effects. It was, it was really incredible. So there's lots of change day to day, week to week in the Microsoft space in particular and our general lives. So we've noticed as far as what we're seeing, that's been a huge thing for us all. I think sometimes it's good to reflect as well and think about how you were working maybe five years ago, for example, maybe when there was a life before Microsoft Teams versus say two years ago versus now. I know a lot of us probably on the call are at home. I can't see to reflect right at this moment on that. Um, but the working from home that we've had in the last two years compared to how um, I used to work at Booper for the Booper people on the call, um, working from home was, you know, that was a new idea when I was at Booper um, a number of years ago. Um, or other organisations, you know, some of it was frowned upon in certain places. So that's been a huge change and benefit to many. This um, slide is, for those that don't recognise it, this is the Microsoft 365 roadmap. Um, in the orange box down the bottom, I've put the URL for you if you're curious. A few months ago, I actually reviewed the data in the roadmap. I ran an export from 1st of July 2020 to 1st of July 2021. I was curious to actually have a look at how many things had been pushed out over that 12 month period. Now, just to note the data I selected, um, a couple of things about that. So as I just said, 1st of July to 1st of July, I was very aware of how much change happened prior to that. In say March to July last year, there was a huge amount of change, but I just deliberately wanted to look at a 12 month window. The data I selected was the feature updates across Microsoft Teams, Microsoft Outlook and the Office Suite. So I didn't want to look at Power Apps and the platform and all this technical stuff that isn't necessarily part of my space. I just deliberately wanted to look at the products I felt that most people use every single day. And the result when I pulled that data in a one year period was 478 rows of changes. And I think the interesting part about that, Megan, is there's a lot of products that don't actually put stuff in the roadmap. I know OneNote certainly doesn't. Um, and there's so much that doesn't make it because they're little things and they and there's so much that I see it all the time in terms of my user group every month. Yeah. And look, with that data, some of it does double up because you have um, an update every time something is, you know, uh, I wrote that down, whether it's in development versus whether it's being launched. So... I was, um, I did start to do a whole lot of analysis, but I need to find an Excel buddy. If anyone on the call is, you know, very much an Excel expert, give me a call. Um, Cause I wanted to do some more work on that data. Um, but essentially I did do some pivot tabling and look at per month and it was averaging at about 30 to 40 items per month. Okay, so we've got multiple things happening every single week in the Microsoft space. And I just thought this was a really interesting perspective to really think about the last year alone, how often in our day to day products that we use all the time are different things being updated and changed. I think this detail alone shows us how fast things have been changing. And I think it really reinforces the term change whiplash from the previous slide. So that was kind of rapid change and change in general. What I want to also talk about with what we're seeing is also considering learning. So a couple, some things to note in the learning space. So one thing that I see from a lot of clients is lean learning programs. 
Okay, what I mean by that is, as you can imagine, is um, cutting back on maybe the traditional things. There's less support sessions. Um, there's a lot more content being uploaded online. As we touched on earlier, um, Microsoft Learning Pathways, a lot of companies enable that. Um, and with that, I think also comes an increase in self-paced learning. So, you know, a lot of our organisations were expecting um, making content available for staff, less face-to-face -face sessions, and I know that obviously there's a COVID impact there, but even remote virtual face-to-face -face sessions, um, less support, less sessions, more content uploaded. And many organisations are doing things like giving staff access to LinkedIn learning, um, learning pathways, and making content available. And I also, think um, also yeah. there on that, Megan, it's shorter learning because you're online. You know, you might have spent a half day or a day learning something. Now it's we've got a one hour and it's webinar. They've changed the modality a lot with it as well. Yeah, it's amazing. Imagine, I mean, Kirsty, Kirsty and I have both known each other um, for a very long time, um, both spend a lot of time in the learning space and we're used to definitely, you know, um, remember when you first learned Excel or Microsoft Project or, you know, you'd go to a one day thing or a four hour session and now it's... Um, day, you do basic, intermediate, advanced, full days of training. Yeah, totally changed. Yeah. yeah. Um, also, a lot of content's generic. Okay. So I'm seeing more and more videos and links to online content that might be, you know, the Microsoft channel on YouTube hopefully reputable content, but things being shared around that are, you know, check out this video, you know, why don't we just give this to our staff? Um, less budget, you know, obviously being leaner, there's a cut in budget for learning programs. Um, and so that tends to sort of flow into the less face-to-face, -face, less support and the free content. Um, now, I know this works to a point, but I think the alarm bells go off for me when I see generic free content is what about con configuration and governance? And I'm sure many of you work in roles where you're very aware that you need to be across how your organisation has configured and set up the applications. And, you know, we don't want people watching videos that talk about um, external sharing when it's been disabled, as an example. And I find that I think that there's, with all this, less decisions based on research and evidence. So this one-size-fits-all approach that's kind of quick snippets, um, free, generic, I think has a place, but, you know, obviously, we're not really considering how adults learn best and what's maybe optimal for the learning strategy or for the organisation. Now, I feel like a real negative Nancy here with all that, um, but just to touch on some of the results, and I don't think any of this is a surprise and many of you are probably seeing it. One thing I wanted to touch on here though, which I thought about when I was think doing this was, I think in some ways we've put unrealistic expectations on employees. Now, I just want to jump to the meeting for a sec, but I was curious, do the raise your hand feature if you're wearing a smartwatch? Need to find you all. So, let me bring that back. So, it made me think about how we have our life set up with alerts. Um, my husband has a really annoying one that reminds him to drink water throughout the day and I can hear it all the time. Um, we get reminded on walking enough, stretching, drinking water. You know, we rely on notifications through Microsoft Teams, meeting reminders. We're using tech to remind us to do day-to-day -day stuff. You know, it might be from our basic needs through to things to do with work. And yet with new tech and new changes, we're expecting people in the workplace to just work it out. So how can we expect people to find their way and learn and change in amongst their job when they're really busy. Who actually reminds us to use the tech and the features in specific ways across our working day? And it's just something that I was thinking about as far as just from a food, food for thought perspective. Now, gauging some of the organisations that I know people are from on the call, I know there will be a lot of variation here. Boopa, being an ex-Boopa, um, I know has a digital workplace and a change team of multiple change managers and major programs. Um, but certainly those of you who maybe work in regional Victoria or smaller organisations will have a very different experience. It's really hard for organisations to keep up. And I think many changes will go unnoticed. There's no way I think any of the organisations on this call, for example, could have kept across 473 rows of updates in the Microsoft roadmap. I feel like I'm doing a sales pitch here, but I'm not. But it's just really good to reflect on the amount of change and what we're going through. Okay, and some of the results you can see here. Okay, so 
In a lot of places, we don't have really strongly embedded ways of working. If anyone's wondering what the wow is, I probably should have expanded on that. And we don't necessarily have really deeply embedded habits because we're just getting by. And then some of the other results might be lower adoption of the tools or features. Um, and then also I love reflecting that on lower ROI, you know, from a business perspective, how much of the platforms. The thing that we were talking about this, in, Megan, was also when you're under pressure, like we've been in the pandemic and so much going on, we have very little tolerance and, and um, time to be able to learn. We don't have our learning mode on. We're on a just a do, 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 do. And we saw even that in Teams where it's just, chat and meetings and people aren't using channels and collaboration and files so we were starting to see all of that those embedded habits and the adoption and ROI they're burning out because they got work and they're trying to juggle yeah. two things yeah and I mean how can we expect deeply embedded habits when our learning is shallow lean generic and once off okay. um, I know that I think I saw Lawrence was on the call um, I know that your work's much more specific and different as well as some of the other products out there and other consultants um, but obviously, I'm talking very general here. And I agree with you, Kirsty. I think a lot of employees have low motivation to learn right now. They're frustrated. They're maybe dissatisfied with the way things are going, whether it be too much change in the tech, whether it be, you know, life, working from home, all of it. And a lot of people are suffering burnout. And as Bryce and, said, judging kids the whole way. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yes. And look, I think it's just the general thing here is that people are not necessarily in an optimal state to learn yet they're expected to own the journey themselves and get it done somehow and then apply that behaviour to their role with new features and changes in tech. So without all that negativity, I just wanted to take a breath here and pause for a sec um, and think for a little bit about some considerations or things to think about moving forward. So I feel like I just lumped a whole lot of information at you. Um, but in considering what now, firstly, I wanted to talk a bit more about learning. And a key thing I wanted to think about is, well, what do we really know about learning? So let's just consider some findings from research in learning over the years. So firstly, there was some really great research by um, McKenna who found that blended learning actually improves adult learning outcomes. And we actually learn best from a blended multifaceted approach. And then in, in addition to this, a separate researcher at Kirshner found that the individuals are actually not shown to be the best owners of their learning journey. These points alone are crucial in the development of organisational learning. Another researcher that I've read called Hager explored the idea that traditional training is actually not enough for job readiness and there needs to be a combination of more applied content and relevant to the workplace. Also commenting that on the job learning is much stronger than people going and reading content. A separate group of researchers called Marsik and Watkins introduced the notion of informal learning and incidental learning. And core to this is the experience and reflection of the learner and having the opportunity to reflect on things. Separate to this, another researcher called Baud felt that the learner, for learning to occur and be effective, people actually need to have engaged in a considerable weight of meaningful tasks connected to what they're trying to learn. So key factors like a feedback loop, meaning, context, informal discussion, having spaces to explore and test and discuss and grow through all of this are crucial for successful learning to be in place. So with all that being said, think back now to the one-off demo or the generic video that maybe some staff are being given. If we actually go a bit deeper and into some more theory, and this might be getting a bit too much, um, but crucial, crucial to learning programs are actual elements of socio-cultural theory, which was described also by Hager, where it's important to cover both elements of the individual and the group in a learning program. The collective group learning actually helps drive the goals and support further growth in individuals and the group as well. So think about the workplace. We're all individuals, but we're in teams, as in departments, teams and broader departments and groups that work together. And the collective learning will help drive any goals there. So we're each learning within our workplace, we're learning new skills, but these skills we're learning are impacted by the group or department. Our learning impacts each other. Um, if I learn to share a document in the way that the organisation wants me to and Kirsty doesn't, well, I'm impacting her and maybe she's driving me to go back to old habits. Our learning impacts each other and it's relevant to think about this as well. 
More successful learning programs involve creating a learning approach that has a broader context with activities that help people get general skills, along with group activities that allow people to apply to their job and test with role play and feedback. Now, while I know that's not always possible, it's just really important to think about all this stuff when we reflect on what are we actually providing employees in the workplace. Those in learning and development roles or some of the other people on the call, you may actually um, have heard of Thornburg. Um, there's this great model, the spaces and places, and it brings into play ideas around formal learning and incidental learning. How we would discuss things maybe around the water cooler in an ad hoc chat and how we learn from each other compared to maybe webinars and training sessions. Um, the campfire in his model is the place where you listen to a leader. It's the one to many. And we can compare this to say a presentation, a webinar or a conf conference session. When we're showing up to hear someone present to us, that's that kind of campfire. Whereas the watering hole is many to many. It's ad hoc. You know, people used to come up to a watering hole, wash their clothes, have a chat, share information. Um, this could be conversations at your desk in the open plan office when we're there, um, or even just on a casual call, you know, that those chit chats before you, where you're waiting for people to join a call. Um, or it could be a discussion thread. It could be like a third space it's known as in, say, Teams, LinkedIn, anywhere where you're in a thread discussing things back and forth. And in the future, I don't know how far away it is yet, but more of that social learning and that conversations attached in um, Viva. Um, and obviously the cave is where you're solo. You know, you can go watch your videos, you can read your books, you can learn in your own way. So you can see the comparisons, how that sort of fits into the workplace. And this great visual is also comparing it to another model, which is the seven spaces model. Um, so you can see some of the, the wording and the comparison here. With these, we know employees learn in many different ways and it's important to revisit all this sort of stuff when we're building organisational learning programs. When it comes to tech, um, the tech that we use, the learning platform, um, one of the other models that's really important to think about is this Bates sections model. Um, I won't go into detail, but if, if you are someone in a role where you do develop learning in the workplace, it's used to assess the technology for suitability, working through key areas in relation to the participant group, um, factors for the situation, the people in the organisation. Um, it's quite a detailed model. And it's really helpful to think about um, not only if your content is important, but the platform you're using to deliver your learning content. Now, that could be that you have an LMS or it could just be thinking around um, the cognitive load that we actually put on people just by joining a team's call, let alone learning within the call as well. So with all of this in mind, how do people know what to learn, have clear goals and context and be in the optimal state with a journey to help them? I don't necessarily think LinkedIn Learning, just by providing them with an account, really provides all of this. And I guess this is what I wanted to kind of just get people thinking about through this session. Well, it's important to think about who drives the learning, you know, who sets the goals. Um, as I touched on earlier, you know, in, in large organisations where there's a lot more budget and maybe more formal development and learning and development plans, then this may actually be done really well. And I've worked in some, but also in many others where it's not anywhere near where it could be. And then also some of the key stuff in here, you know, there's there's a lot more complex things come into play, like leadership, top down involvement, you know, people talking the talk with regards to how we work in the workplace. The goals of the organisation and the strong leadership and that behaviour you want to drive are cru crucial as well. So that was just I just wanted to dive deeper into learning, because I think a lot of people may even be in roles where they've um, moved into a digital workplace role an adoption role or there's different areas where it's not necessarily delved into that deeply to consider why do we build learning programs the way we do? Um, and it's good to reflect and think about how they could be just a bit different. The other area that I wanted to explore, just get the juices flowing in this session, is actually also just some of the psychology around our habits. And I'll shift this, I will shift this to more towards why this is important for Microsoft 365 in a tick. But I wanted to just think about also, what do we know about human behavior and habits? We know the more you repeat something, the more it becomes automatic. Think about brushing your teeth, for example. The more you repeat it, the more the structure of your brain actually changes, helping you become really efficient in that activity. So to build a habit, we know that you need to practice it. Now, remember, and I think 
a lot of you can already apply this to the workplace. Um, it's human nature to follow the law of least effort and people are naturally going to gravitate towards the option that requires the least amount of work. It's, it's physics. Um, it, what just came into my mind was just attach that document to an email because it just works, doesn't it? Um, but there's a lot of research and great information on how we create good habits. So in creating them, it's key that it's obvious and it's easy and people feel satisfied when they do that habit. And this will make people more likely to repeat the behaviour. Alternatively, if we want them to break a bad habit, it needs to be invisible, unattractive, difficult and unsatisfying. Key to this can be also accountability. So humans have a strong desire to fit in and get approval um, and to be respected and praised. And we can actually use this to our advantage in the workplace, I think, with ways of working. If we want behaviour to stop, we can block it. Um, I talked to a client recently who said, we've disabled the ability for anyone to in, um, email internally because she just wants everything in Teams. So she's physically or technically blocking that actual ability. Um, but I think it's important we can think about this sort of stuff to consider what needs to change across your organisation. There was a really great table, I don't know if Kirsty you remember, um, that's really old in the Microsoft adoption space and it's um, the start-stop behaviours. And it's yeah. something that I've referred to a lot in my work is bringing it back to um, start-stop behaviour workshops and actually drilling down. And when you develop strong ways of working in your organisation, it's key to really break it down and think about Rather than we want OneDrive, let's do some one-hour OneDrive training sessions. Well, that's really great. There's more work after that that needs to happen. If you want people to work across the organisation, um, what are your ways of working? I like to think of ways of working as being the sum of their parts. Um, and what I mean by that is the ways that we work with OneDrive are the individual habits and little features and things we do in OneDrive that make up how we work with OneDrive in general. You know, with OneDrive, we learn how to share with links. We learn how to store. We learn how to manage access to a document. Um, and so I wanted to just think about that for a sec and feel free to throw something into chat um, or unmute, but pull this towards what are some examples of automatic habits in Microsoft 365? Um, so for example, to begin with, bad or good, dare I ask, what are some habits that you see in your workplace to do with sharing documents? Um, just going to find you again. So I touched on attaching a document to an email. Everyone loves talking about that habit. Um, you know, I know there are reasons why sometimes people still need to do it. Um, but does anyone want to unmute or share bad habits or good habits that if you think about sh um, sharing documents that are the automatic things that you do and you think of? In some of my notes, Um, so, you know, we email documents. Oh, it's flashing. Let me have a look here. Uploading couples, couples of files into Teams instead of sharing links, definitely. Um, uploading duplicates, sharing duplicates and then being all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, or just I would a downloaded say, version. Yeah. Yep. Download, email. I've got, I've got one because you have so many tenants and working with clients and trying to, some of them I have to actually log out of Teams and log in or try and have multiple, you know, browsers open, that I've found that in terms of communicating it's becoming easier to fall back to email because I know yeah. they live there because it becomes easier sometimes for me, not so much sometimes them. So just with all the swapping and switching of context, you go, ah, oh, just going back because it's easier. <laughs> There's tenant switching can be a nightmare. I'm working in an organisation at the moment that has six brands merging into one tenant and everyone's half-half. And, yeah, I one stakeholder, I email everything. Everyone else is in teams. So, yeah, um, one-line emails instead of, Daniel, I guess you're, I'm feeling that your inbox gets busy and you don't like that. Um, anonymous links, yes. Definitely. They're starting to flow through now, aren't they? Yeah. So there are many things that people do. And I'm sure you get that feeling of someone, someone, sometimes someone does something and it is literally a habit. It's I'm going to share it. Bang. What's the automatic response I have and what do I do? Um, and one of the other areas I was thinking about was storing documents, you know, desktop, LAN, file share, cloud, Teams, maybe shadow IT. You know, there's so many different ways people store and it can be really messy. What about, what are some bad habits or good with meetings? What are some of those things that people do? I feel like all the bad is going to come out. Um, when I think of meetings, I feel like share screen 
there are still some habits there where people always do it the same way and gets clunky and they don't quite get that right. Um, any thoughts around things in meetings that maybe people do that could be different? What have I got down? Oh, one of my pet peeves is getting an invite without anything in the body. No structure, no agenda. Um, and that's a habit people send it off. Um, not using scheduling assistant. I really hope that habit doesn't exist anymore, but I think it does. Yes, Andrew, I also wrote down um, bad quality. Um, bad quality microphones. Um, using the iPhone earbuds where the, you know, picks up all the noise and it impacts everyone else. You guys are really getting in the flow of this, aren't you? Bad lighting, yeah, yeah. Um, so they are, there are these little things. Um, and the other one I had was even thinking about gathering information. So you know when people send an email and ask something and everyone replies? Or um, they ask a question and they expect us to all, and I think, are all these 20 people gonna send you an email back to, for you to get your answer? And this might not be as common or you know shifted to but it's great when people use things like polls and forms and collect data in a way that's going to be really good for them um, so just trying to get across i guess this perspective of when you think about ways of working in your organization it's not about a product it's not about let's roll out this product well we have to train on it we're actually trying to get people to change their behavior okay and um, i'm getting distracted by chat now i've got to move it um, but thank you i want to read all these afterwards because there's lots of um Emoji, emojis and stuff happening there. Um, so yeah, for developing ways of working, it's really important, I think, to start to actually pause, reflect, and think about some of this stuff. Um, I don't want to make it seem really over complex. I think, um, and I know some of you on the call who I know the work that they do can probably will probably already know, you know, how to tackle this. And one of them is things like community management. You know. Um, if you do a really thorough change management program, yes, you're going to run training, but there's wrapping it up in all those other activities that help, you know, promote the behaviours and promote how you want people to use the tools, you know, as Kirsty said earlier, snippets and all that sort of stuff. Um, and so how do you develop and drive good habits and how do you manage this and innovate ongoing is key to think about. Um, the other thing I had on this slide, and I will move on in a sec because I'm not watching the clock, is collaboration contracts. This is not my thing. This has been talked about by a few MVPs and people over the years is accountability is really important as well. So you can expect individuals to watch videos, but there's so much power in getting a group of people like a department or a small team together to workshop together, build their ways of working, to find what are the habits they want to drive and get that accountability so they can drive each other as well. Um, OK, the just to finish up. The one other thing I want to I've driven it, I've driven it even further on the collaboration yeah. contracts, but now I don't say I'm actually doing training. I say what I'm going to do is we're going to workshop together and I work team by team. I don't do training, you know, individuals. I go, I will train team by team. And as part of that, it's then working on, well, what's a scenario, creating a contract that that's how they're going to do it so they understand how they're going to function and they're getting trained at the same time to do it so I change the wording because if I say I'm not training then they want to come along so I want to workshop better ways to collaborate together instead of instead of I'm training you on how to collaborate I think for a really innovative training program or change or development program videos and learning is almost like what you want people to enter having done into yeah. a workshop like that and yeah. really then develop and work together on it yeah um the other thing that I wanted to, um, if you only take one thing away from this session, I've said a lot of words, um, but a key thing that I really wanted to also, because I know a lot of you talk about ADCAR, in, particularly in the Microsoft space, we always talk about the ADCAR method, um, is the R in ADCAR, okay? I think poor old R in ADCAR is like the, gets the lowest budget and the least attention. And so one of the critical things in all of this is, you know, um, is just the attention that we place on that, Projects close, consultants move on, things fizzle. There's not enough time or budget that goes into the ongoing journey and reinforcing goals and behaviour and really, you know, giving people the feedback loop, giving them the, the attention and the support to really learn through all of this. So um, thank you. That was just, as I said, Kirsty and I had a chat recently and we were talking about how things were going and I just, as I do, um, I feel like fireworks went off in my brain and I went, you know what, there's some stuff that I wouldn't mind talking about that I find interesting. Hopefully you found some of that interesting too. Hopefully even a couple of you have gone, you know what, 
maybe that's sort of giving you a refresher of some stuff either that you've learned in the past or maybe it's new. Um, I dropped a little, a lot of um, research names in there as well when I was talking about some of the theory and stuff. Um, please reach out. I was going to put a references slide, but um, I actually didn't and forgot, to be honest, totally slack of me. But if you do want to know more or um, be connected to any of the stuff you want to know more about, just reach out to me. Um, this is me. Um, that's my website and my Twitter handle. Um, and um, yeah, reach out to Kirsty if you just want my email as well. I didn't put it on there. Um, okay. But I'll thank you. Um to drop off your presentation if you can stop presenting and I'll just flick live back over so because it's giving me the can't display <clears throat> flicking from PowerPoint in let's just see if we can get it to present and in the meantime don't forget your awesome YouTube channel <laughs> yeah yeah but I, I, that's true thanks Lynn and hi Lynn sure. haven't seen you hi. <laughs> um, I, I'm on a YouTube channel as in I have one called the Strands, and um, I've been doing M3, uh, boosts so I'll put it in the chat because I've been doing um, two minute snippets. Part of it is to expand my video skills, hate being on video and I'm working towards that. But um, yeah, um, some clients have actually grabbed them and sent them around. So I will do that now. Okay, oh, yeah. let's just see if I can get this to, to do it. I think what's happening is because I have the, um, because I have the tenant, it's going, hang on a second, which one are you trying to open to? <laughs> it's giving me all sorts of interesting stuff. Having different tenants can um, cause all sorts of problems. Okay, so it's it's bringing the presentation back in again. I have to pass that on in terms of uh, upload a copy. I'm just going to go replace again. And let us do its load up. Okay, so um, thanks, Megan. I mean, uh, I know that we're we're towards the end of our usual time. As I said, it's going to take me, you know, uh, I'd say another sort of twenty to 30 minutes to get through some of the Ignite content. I'll crack through it um, once I've got it loaded up here for you. I understand if you do need to go, but please feel free to watch the recording. If you can stay, then please stay. Um, if you are leaving, just note that next month, when we're running it on the first Tuesday of the month, I'm actually going to have Rishi Nikolai coming back in. There's been updates and changes to the Mocha framework, and he's bringing in all hybrid work and all sorts of really cool stuff there. So um, if you would like to come next month there's going to be some rather cool stuff let's move forward let me just see if I can get it to jump forward in the presentation uh, uh, let's go both forward 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 it's doing its own thing doesn't want to jump forward okay we're getting there getting there Thanks, me and Megan. If I, uh, Megan, if I can actually get you to forward through your presentation to me as well, because I will drop it into the deck for everyone so they can actually see it too. Right now, getting to understand. Let's go to the next bit. I'm just going to spotlight. Okay. That makes it just a little easier to see. So what's new across Microsoft 365? Here we go. Are we ready? This is going to be um, intense. Okay. Yes, I talk fast. You can pause me if you're watching the recording. Um, there's going to be plenty here to talk about. Um, okay. So live transcript is now going to be there in unscheduled meetings and using the Meet Now and Channel meetings. Okay. You have to allow the transcription policy to be turned on. So there is some more features there around how to do that. Um, breakout room support, the manager support. It used to be kind of presenter support. It's now calling manager support. Bit of a you know name name flick over if you're looking at it. Um, but only participants who are named as presenters can actually be appointed as breakout room managers. So you've now got managing the rooms um, coming into play. And some of these things we've kind of talked about in the past, or they've had some updates or changes, and it's all kind of getting tweaked. Um, yeah, love love. Um, breakout rooms, Kerry, I agree, especially as trainers and things like that. So what's happening in the Teams calling space? There's new one-on-one -on -one calling now in the Safari web browser. So it's the web components that were having some sort of issues that's now flowing through. There's some good operator connects and a general availability now across Australia. This is all that PSTN type working with Optus and Telstra, for example. So we're fleeing, seeing it flow more through into Australia to be able to support some calling um, new devices have come out by Jabra. Um, I work quite closely with Jabra. In fact, I have here, where's my box? Here is my new Jabra um, Panacast. Yay. 
So I'm loving that one in the camera. So I, technically I can kind of stand up and walk around because it gives you a 180 view. Oh, there she's got a panacast. Very good. Nice to see, you know, there. <laughs> um, so some really great tech that's coming in. When you look at the panacast, for example, and some of this new tech, the, in, the intelligence side of it that's coming into play in terms of recognising who's speaking and putting the names against it and some really fabulous stuff actually happening there. Okay. Um, the chat collaboration side of things. So you've actually now got, and this is going a little bit more in terms of the education space if you're in there, and um, chat supervisors can actually delete messages now. So this is in the chat side of things. So it's sort of keeping in mind that they can delete, you know, inappropriate, off topic and other chat sort of team sorts of things where they need to supervise the young, for example, and make sure that they're all behaving nicely. So there are those sorts of features that flow through that are really quite cool and clever. And I know we're kind of more the enterprise space, but if you've got children, and I kind of thought, oh, that might be one you might like to know in terms of supporting them. Um, when it comes to uh, uh, one thing I absolutely love that just got presented um, was that Visio is now coming in as free inside, you know, Microsoft Teams with that whole viewer to be able to support you in a simple way to be able to do commenting and sharing and printing and downloading those diagrams or images that sort of um, PDF fabulous news because I know there's been so many issues with just some of the basics being there to be able to support us around Visio. So so loving that one. That's a big one for, for me. Um, it's moving around. So what else we got? So your tab actions inside Teams, that it's actually kind of moving around. You kind of sort of had them, they're coming down now that when you do the drop down on your tab, you're going to see it there now, like go to web, for example. So that's actually changed. And then Q&A in Teams is now in public preview. We've talked about Q&A previously. So that little icon is going to be up the top there to, to instigate Q&A as part of your part of your meeting. OK, what else have we got? Multi language for your Teams meeting. So now when you set it up, it needs to be done by the administrator as to what languages you want to include. If you are in an international organisation, you can have it where it can be in different languages when you send it out from Australia to other countries. So that can be set up. I need to put the I in there on the invite any team members. I'll fix that. Um, they can uh, chat now across um, uh, so any, any user, whether they're actually out there and they've got private accounts or anything uh, like a Teams consumer side of things, you can invite anyone in to chat depending on the compliance policies inside a business. Um, so that's starting in December and should hopefully be finished fairly quickly. There's extended support for text predictions now across Outlook and iOS. Um, and all meetings created in Outlook are going to have um, for Outlook online by default. So you will always have the Teams link in every meeting invite rather than having to press make it a Teams meeting. So the new default will be automatically a meeting in Teams without you having to go, I want the Teams meeting. OK. Some of the new and coming. Look, as I said, there's a ton of stuff. So I've put in some of the links. Some of these I will go a little bit into. Some I just won't because there's so much new, uh, really great new features in there. OK. Um, same again. Look. One of the things I'm going to show you and got announced as part of Ignite. If you remember, and it was like a good two years ago, even I was talking about the Fluid framework and what that actually looked like inside um, our, our Office 365 environment. So what it's kind of had is a bit of a name change. It's now called Microsoft Loop. And I'm going to show you a little quick video, it's sort of a two minute video of what that actually means. There are three main components in terms of Loop. You've got a Loop components, Loop pages, and Loop workspaces. So it's a whole other sort of productivity way of working. The thing that I loved about it was being able to take components of Loop and just drop it into Teams, things like tables for status tracking kind of stuff. And it's all part of kind of your loop um, workspaces and um, so you've got all this sort of status tracking and um, Ter Simon Terry of course uh, Aussie MVP here in terms of you know change he did a bit of reflections on loop and it coming from a little bit of um, human behavior let me just play the video for you so you can see what it's about
There you go. Just a little bit of a snippet around what's coming, this whole new productivity features. There's going to be a lot of, well, why would I use that? What is it? And it's a bit confusing and I, I, you know, what do I use when I want to do? And so that, that's all going to come up and, you know, we'll work with it over time. I suppose it's a, um, when you look at the, when you dive into it a little bit more and it's actually available, you know, it's in um, preview, you can start to have a look at it. Um, have a bit of a dive in and a bit of a play and get to get to know it and have a look at the, let me move forward, have a look at the, um, um, those links that I've shown you around Loop, okay? Microsoft have acquired ClipChamp. So I don't know if you have heard of this or seen it. They're actually a video, video editing app that's available sort of for creators to be able to empower you if you do YouTube or Instagram and things like that. Now, when you go and log in, so I've put on there the home to ClipChamp. When you go and log in with your Microsoft 365 account, what it does, you get a free sort of basic account to be able to do things. But that free account means you can only export in 480p. So if you want to go up to a higher level of export, you're going to need to start paying for it as a user in terms of video editing, for example. At the moment, because it is web-based, there's no 4K option in terms of the web side of things. So, um, but if you do, you know, video editing, it's kind of in there, in the tools now to be able to help and support you. There is some cool stuff there, okay? Um, in terms of the desktop app, I don't know if anyone actually used the Office desktop app. Um, rather fabulous, a good thing to actually get your users around. Um, there's some really cool stuff there in terms of the app for your desktop that comes with Windows. You've got the My Content Review and um, to be able to help you get to your recent documents, for example. Maybe I'll just ask if we can have whoever's not on mute, maybe go to mute for me, please. We're getting a bit of feedback. Um, then also you've got quick access to templates so you can create and do things there really quickly and easily. So they've got one place to go, a bit like you do on your mobile phone. So it actually goes across the not just their desktop but through to their mobile phone. And there's some new filters there in terms of people and meetings. One thing to get to know is they've got share directly from here. It's like this sort of desktop app that combines everything together. They've got action items there in terms of adding in, for example, send it into um, your to-do or send it into your calendar and converting things over to PDF. So all those kind of little action items are all brought together into one place in the app. Rather cool little productivity piece. And so if you're not familiar with it, I recommend it. New to PowerPoint. What you've got is this new recording studio. It's actually been announced as part of Ignite coming through and this way, what you can do is it gives you all these teleprompter views and different presenter views and slides. You can edit and share and export your presentation for stream, for example. So you kind of um, can download it and then upload it into uh, upload it into stream with all this sort of different functionality for your PowerPoint. Um, some rather cool stuff there to go and have a look at in terms of your new recording studio for PowerPoint, especially if you're building content. What's new to Whiteboard? We did talk about Whiteboard and all of the great new features that are coming. There's more content that's been put out there in terms of the blogs, um, in, in terms of inserting documents in. There's a couple of new little things that have come along in terms of the Whiteboard. Um, we showed a little video last month if you wanted to have a look at the previous months, but you'll see it also if you like through these links in terms of inserting docs and other features and functionality. What's coming to Planner? Okay, we've got recurring tasks. So that's rather cool in terms of recurring tasks coming into Planner. Yay! You know, loving that one. I don't know about anyone else liking that one. And the other thing is the rich text and images in your task note now. Okay, so that enabling highlighting and text formatting and keyboard shortcuts. And so I'm loving that too flowing through in terms of what's coming for Planner. What's new in Outlook? Get ready for the new Outlook for Mac. It is coming. There are some skilling up sessions in terms of sort of that office experience. I've put the link in there in terms of the aka.ms. Um, so go and have a look at what's actually coming out in terms of the Outlook for Mac if you do have Mac users in your business or you use a Mac at home. 
What I do love, and although these are kind of the more Windows sort of features, you've now got recurring scheduler for Outlook with Cortana with some new commands that are flown through. So if you use Cortana on your desktop, you can actually ask it to do um, for every day and you can do it every two weeks for meetings or you can schedule, you know, every month. So I'm liking the fact that I can do those commands by just saying, and I won't do it out loud because if I do it out loud, my Cortana is going to start kicking off on me to do things. Um, especially when I'm thinking and I'll often go uh, do it because I do it with my phone with, you know, Siri and I do it with, you know, other things. Okay. What's new for Yammer? Look, a lot of this stuff we kind of have talked about um, and there's a few things that are actually coming as well. Um, whiteboard in terms of external users at this point, um, no. Uh, something to keep an eye out on though, Jeff, okay. Um, official communities available in Yammer, we've talked about that before. The one thing I did want to bring in from the blog that I thought was important was what are we going to class, kind of what is Microsoft class and determine as an official community? Okay, these are the sorts of things. To get an official community, what you will actually note is and I'll just get my little red pen here, it actually gives you this little official community. So when they go to do a search, it will give you those little icons to define the fact that it's actually official community, okay? Yammer, you can now have it where you can, uh, you're, if you're an administrator or a community, you know, the community admin, Restricted posts. So if you've got something like a, you know, safety type uh, um, uh, community and you need to just push out, it's that they can't actually create posts inside that community, but they can reply and read and react in those terms of those conversations. So this is what the settings actually look like. So you can change the posting permissions over to restricted here. Um, there is, there is, um, yeah, Year of Yammer. I know there's so much content coming out for Yammer, especially now that we've got Viva connections flowing through. We're seeing it really integrating beautifully in the 365 space. Um, bye, Josh. Understand you need to go. All good. Um, what else? We've got the new community header options for Yammer. So what you'll see there in terms of your, your um, feed and what actually comes up, um, community name, description, ability to join, leave, and it's all there at the top of your community feed by default. There's an admin toggle now for mandatory notifications, so you can allow the community ad, um, admins to change the announcements sort of delivery options. So we've then got sort of some, a little bit more control around notifications as an admin. And we can also customise the icon for your communities inside the Microsoft Teams app through the Teams Admin Centre, by the way. So whoever's looking after your Teams Admin is the one that can actually change it. Because I know um, that there are a lot of organisations that sort of change what they want Yammer to sort of be. And they so that's where kind of the icons and logos and they make it more like, a you know, social sort of environments. There are some new layout and updates for the conversations SharePoint web part. So we've got a new horizontal layout, a new filter option around the questions and conversations and the options to show hide um, the Yammer publisher. So these are all now some updates that are flowing through. The what's coming, the team, um, you know, Steve was Steve was on there and chatting and some good stuff around what's actually coming around successful engagement. I highly recommend going and actually watching from Ignite uh, what's actually coming down the line around Yammer. What's coming in stream, there is a lot happening across the t a stream space, okay? Um, some really cool stuff that I do particularly like around, especially around the Teams meeting recording, some of the improvements there, the multi-speed playback, loving the multi-speed playback. So you can fast forward and have it um, doing in a higher speed so you don't have to watch it in real time. That one to me is a is a winner. I, I talk fast, listen fast, so speed up, speed up, speed up. <laughs> so what might be in an hour, you can bring it right down to sort of 40, 45 minutes maybe easily. Um, so those are the sorts of things. Um, there's a migration tool preview that's actually come out, um, new distribution channels. So you can actually see, uh, 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 I'll let you go and have a look. Okay, I'll move on. We've got too much to go through. I know it gets all a bit exciting and I want to talk about it. <laughs> um, what else is there? 
We've got the ability now for the enabling the users with to have that edit permissions around the video that's stored in OneDrive for Business and SharePoint document library to generate closed captions rather than the owner generating the closed captions. Um, you've actually then, depending on their permissions, they can generate. So it would always depend on what the permissions are, but any viewer then of the video with that transcript will be able to display it as a closed caption. Do like that one. Um, stream admins can now also permanently remove videos in bulk from a recycle bin. It used to be that you could kind of only do yours, and if you had uh, big recycle bins, for example, became then difficult. The fact that we can do auto empty and you know push things out to do big cleanups because um, you couldn't do that in the past. We've got toggle features that have now come in around the video settings that you can turn on automatically transcripts and um, you know a few other things around the audio video. So these are the sort of the new toggle features that have come through. So that just now is a toggle to make it just that little bit easier around comments and transcripts. In SharePoint, the what's new? There's a whole heap of stuff as always. They're always building on the SharePoint space. I always put the pit stop in to give you a little bit of a you know an idea of what's coming in terms of the hub hub to hub site association is rather cool. Um, the templates. Now, I haven't put the templates into here. They are mainly focused on the retail healthcare and not-for-profit, so there are specific templates around there for those guys. Um, some of these other ones I'm going to talk about with links in here. I, What I love is the image editing that's now available in SharePoint and OneDrive. Love it. Really simple basics that are editing. It's not complex. Um, it is still on sort of the low level. You can look if you want to bring it down, open it up, do full editing of your picture and load it back in. But we've now at least got some of those um, cool basics in there to be able to work with. You've also got calendar view in your list web part now. You had it inside Teams in terms of lists. But now you've got that calendar view is in the web part as well. So it's taken everyone kind of goes, I'm seeing it in Teams, but I'm not seeing it online. So that is now there in terms of calendar view. Go and have a look at what's actually coming in terms of SharePoint and OneDrive, heaps of stuff. Um, what's new, if you are embedding a web part in your SharePoint spaces, when you go to insert those web space, you know, those web parts, you had some difficulties in terms of some of the previewer and what that actually looked like. Now, if you go and bring in and add in content in the web part, things like um, forms and, you know, PowerPoint and SharePoint, other pages and Power Apps, now they come up in terms of that HTML as a really nice sort of embedded web part, okay, instead of the linking and a few other things, okay. There is a new entry point for lists for SharePoint. Down on the left hand banner, you'll actually see now lists there, which is great, but it also cannot be disabled or customized. So if you're not liking the fact that it's now coming up on your menu, too bad, so sad, uh, but it is actually there now as a part of standard getting in. Okay, bye, Lawrence. Great to have you in here. Thanks. So what else we got? Uh, okay. If you want to use templates, we did touch on templates previously in terms of SharePoint. We've now got the ability to have SharePoint templates coming in. It is a commandlet, so it is a PowerShell commandlet. So if you're sort of not up on sort of those, and for me, this is goes way outside my skill set. I'm not as techy as some others, um, but you can actually build those site templates for your SharePoint so that you can have them there to select from in the template gallery for your staff. So you've got the from Microsoft and then up the top here um, from your organization. You can click on that and then choose your templates that you actually want to have in here. OK. Announced at Ignite was your SharePoint syntax. This is very much around a sort of a very much an AI piece to be able to amplify the way that we actually work um, and what you see, I suppose, throw up for you when you're working in SharePoint. It's about what surfaces along the way. Go and have a look at it. I know I'm not explaining it particularly well, but it's about content and it is a little bit more on the sort of technical. If you're working in SharePoint, really important you kind of get your head around it um, because the way that it brings and up information for people is is um, something to understand. 
I have here also, there's a getting started in terms of adoption to be able to help your audience understand what's coming up for them if you need to know how to get your head around it. In terms of what's new for OneDrive, there's a new simplified command bar that's coming in to be able to focus on content a little better to get the right file. Um, so there's access primary command. So you can see it's a little bit, it's going to change. So if you've got content that you've actually created and guides or anything internally, you're going to need to change the pictures out because that's the new command bar that's going to be coming up for you. List data in boards. So now um, your lists are giving you boards a bit like your planner. You had boards there. You've now got boards coming through for lists. I really like this view and you can then drag them around as well. Modern lookup is flowing through in terms of, you know, creating a creating a column. Um, go and have a look at what that actually looks like in terms of some of the modern lookup. You've also got creating and viewing lists from the SharePoint app bar now. Um, the rich text editor, which I talked about a little earlier in terms of lists, this is what it actually looks like. Okay, so there's that sort of picture we did talk about. It's kind of way back when. That's a picture around it. So I do particularly like what we're seeing over here in terms of the create and view lists ex directly here. So we talked about the create and view, and this is what it's going to look like. Okay. In terms of some of the other announcements, they've got improved link sharing is going to be flowing through. I do like this one. It's in terms of targeted release. Um, lists for Android and then fast and offline. I love the fact that we've got that whole offline coming through in terms of lists. So they're speeding things up a little there. Um, packaging list templates to be able to help and support you. Um, that is with the Power Platform and some of the rules around it. And uh, I highly recommend going and having a look at some of the, you know, what's new in the session. There's a little video that's there in the what's new for Microsoft list, this whole on demand. So um, I, uh, I really did enjoy it. Look, the what's new in Viva, there is so much flowing through. We talked about it at last month. I would really recommend if you're going to look at anything, is around some of the manager features or in um, some of the stuff that it's actually throwing to you for a best practice for managers and supporting them to be able to work and engage on meetings and things like that. Um, go and have a look at that. That one I do recommend. So the other thing that I do like is around learning. So we've now got learning. It's available in, uh, it's generally available for everyone now in terms of Viva Learning. And there are some great new partner integrations coming into play. Do you know, you've got Skillsoft and Pluralsight, you know, um, Udemy, 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 right. edX, for example. So all these now are all flowing in on the learning space. I do like this. On the connection side of things, um, you know, we did have there some of this stuff before, but we're seeing more and more coming through. DocuSign in particular is another really good one that I'm liking in terms of dropping into Microsoft Teams as that sort of app and support as well as through interconnections. I'm working on the go with your mobile. Uh, look, there's lots flowing through. There's a little video there that I think is great that you could potentially use for your end users. So I've put that down the bottom there, the Office app for your mobile, a bit like the desktop. Take that now over through to the mobile phone and what can you do on your mobile phone? Like if you're trying to help your audience get to know what you can do on the mobile phone, it's a really cool video that you can actually put up there and watch. And it's the same as the other one. It's around about sort of 15, 16 minutes if I remember rightly. Okay. Um, a technology that's actually used in Microsoft Word now is being surfaced to be able to help you to do spelling and grammar and those refinements across Outlook iOS. So it will do sort of some of those auto create. Um, auto uh, uh, correct, sort of a bit like the predictive text. It's, there's lots of other little things that are flowing through in terms of the tech in Outlook to be able to support you. Microsoft Teams has a new feedback portal. We've been using the user voice for some time. It's now flown over into the new feedback portal, portal with some rather good uh, search features and functionalities that you can just tick on and off. I used it actually this morning um, because so we are chatting with someone and they go, we want to be able to have multiple tabs open in Teams and it's frustrating me and it's now being looked at. So I kind of went, well, here's the link. Go, yo, this is in the new feedback portal. Rather, rather cool. 
There are some upcoming events, workshop. I did talk about one at the very beginning in terms of the training for next week. There are others that are going to have some online content. Some of it is in person. Of course, we can't get to. But I find a lot of this content does go up online. Keep an eye out for it. Um, there are other really cool speakers that are out there. And there are also the recordings from Microsoft Ignite, some fabulous sessions there that I was on sort of during the night watching and engaged on too. So go have a look at those. And of course, the Envision ones from a little while ago. The other thing I've, that's coming up is, and I've already signed up to these ones, they've got an Ask Me Anything session for Microsoft Teams. They are around security and governance, phone, Teams adoption and rooms and devices. So I've put the link in here in terms of the driving uh, Microsoft Teams adoption. It is going to be from 6 to 7 on Wednesday, the 10th. Um, so that's actually next week. So I'll be doing that before my training for the for the day. So it's going to be a busy morning of learning. Um, but you can sign up for them. So there are the Ask Me Any sessions. So you can you know have a chat with the team. There's also one for Viva, of which there's deployment and adoption included in there. Okay, that is from five to six a.m. on Wednesday the following week. So if you it'll be a bit of an early start, but I, I do like the fact that the adoption one is at least a little bit more in our time zone rather than from the, the 2 to two to 7 a.m. for this one, kind of that's sort of the time it's running for. Go to it all if you really want to get up, um, but I'm going to be focused more on the adoption. And all the same stuff has passed in terms of your links and resources and where you can actually find it is all there in the presentation, the user groups, Microsoft Reactor. Um, Megan is actually going to be presenting next week at the at the Reactor. So um, go sign up, go watch. She's going to be talking. I think you're talking um, the, the around diversity, if I remember rightly, Megan. Yeah, I'm talking about hidden disability and how tech can help. That's correct. Thank you. So go to Microsoft Reactor and you can actually go and join into her session, which is fabulous. I've put in here the past presentations and what they're actually about. Now I'm sort of bringing that in for you if you want to go back. That's just for this year um, and I'll try and keep them a little bit more next year. Don't forget, we've got Rishi coming to speak to us with all the new mocker updates and including all the hybrid work and some really great flow through. Um, he has a new sort of international role, which um, he can sort of talk to us a little bit more around what he's doing around some of the psychology for um, Mocker. And if you're not familiar with Mocker, he has presented previously. You can go back to past events and you can go watch. Um, or you can go to the adoption site and it's actually got Mocker there on the Microsoft adoption site around what it is. So any questions, feel free. I know we've kind of slammed and I've gone, you know, a little over. I did say it would probably be a bit good, potentially 20 to 30 minutes. There is so much more content there, guys. As I said, there was only so much that I could go through um, in the session. I wish I'd made the session for an hour and a half. Uh, when do I sleep? Ah, pff, sleep is overrated. <laughs> <laughs> I generally live on around about five hours. Um, and as I said, and if I'm not doing that, I'm cake decorating and I'm having fun and doing jigsaw puzzles. And I know it's a little bit like 100 miles an hour. So um, feel free, go back to the recording. And the, as I said, the presentation, what I'll do is I will bring up for you the link to the presentation. So I'll just drop it in now. Once the recording is uh, live, I will I will just pop it in for you. OK, so this is the link to the presentation for today. And very soon we'll have uh, uh, Megan's presentation in there for you as well. And uh, hopefully you've enjoyed the session and we'll see you again next month when we cross fingers. We'll have a little less to potentially talk about on the what's new. Um, anything that you want to ask questions on, uh, in terms of anything I've commented on or the new features, then please feel free. I think I've picked up questions along the way. Learning platforms are great for this. I know, Megan. I oh, know it's a tough one, isn't it? Um, lots to do. Okay, anything else here? We should. Uh, yeah, okay, it looks like we've got everything there. Awesome. Thanks for being in, Megan. Well, I really do appreciate you presenting. Good luck, everyone, and have a fabulous weekend, and we'll see you in a month's time. Thank you very much, Kirsty. You're very welcome. Bye, all. Thank you.